Greetings, Bella Mark and Erica here. Um, attached in this email, um, I will have a calendar for you with some highlighted points and the highlighted points your parents can pay attention to. Um, but one I really want to stress is this Wednesday before your small groups, we will be having a teaching mass and Father Mark is going to be going over the mass teaching what it is we do and why we do it right the signs and the symbols where where different parts of the mass come from in scripture mm -hmm. so really kind of it doesn't make it something that so impersonal now we kind of see how it has been with us throughout all history yep um, to yeah so i really want to encourage you guys to attend you will have enough time to do this and then get into your small groups afterwards so it starts at 6 30 wednesday night i think you'll find it very interesting yes yeah, and, yeah. Um, so your questions have been like spot on, um, so much so that they're actually in correlation with our themes. Um, so we had quite a few on the Eucharist, and this week's theme is Moses and the Eucharist. And we had quite a few on reconciliation. So when we meet again on the 24th, um, we will talk about the reconciliation questions because that will be that week's theme. Um, so I would like to revisit or talk about the questions, then we'll get into the story and answer the questions as we go. Um, the first question that we had is why does the bread and wine still taste the same even after it's supposed to be Jesus? Who makes the bread and wine for the Eucharist? Are they specially made or store-bought? Mm -hmm. Why use bread and wine? Why not something like lamb chops and water? When does the bread and wine actually become Jesus during the Mass, and how? That being said, let's talk about Moses and the Eucharist. Oh, and there is a lot to go through, so put on your seatbelts, because I'm going to have to get through this stuff really, really quickly, because this is um, a particular favorite topic of mine. So, in regards to Moses, so Moses has, um, God has freed the Israelites from the Egyptians, and they're wandering around in the desert right mm -hmm. and they're wandering around on their way towards um, towards their promised land but like we they get lost along the way that's the, the idea behind the story they are they follow God's teachings they fall out of God's teachings they fall back into God's teachings along the way and after 40 years of wandering around they're getting tired of wandering through the desert not eating that well and actually quite they're actually starving so they start to complain to Moses they say, why did you take us out of Egypt um, to bring us out here just to starve to death? You know, if you know anybody who really has been uh, without food for a long time, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a hard place to be. So they said, oh, that you would have just left us back in Egypt in slavery, but at least our bellies would have been full. Because you're really good, I think, a strong idea of how much they were really um, starving for food. And Moses steps aside and he speaks to the Lord. He says, Lord, I need, you need to do something. Um, if, I, if I don't do something fast, if we don't do something for them, they're going to stone me. They are really, really, they've reached their limits. And the Lord says to, to Moses, he said, I've heard my people's groaning and complaints. I will take care of them. Uh, I, will, I will feed them manna from heaven. So when they wake up the next day, they find, in, in the, and there's a kind of fog that lifts off the ground, and they find this substance um, that is white as um, hoarfrost, hoar I think is what the actual ter term for it is. And it is a substance that can be gathered up and made into bread. And Moses says, here's the thing. You can only take up enough that you need for a day. You can't take up any more. And then on, on Saturday, you can take two days worth since there's no working on Sunday. So this is the, sim the symbolism here is that God, hearing the cries of his people, um, shows him that he will take care of them both physically by, by giving them bread, and then as well as spiritually, that I've heard you and I told you that I will take care of you. If you just trust in me, I'll take care of you. So it's a really strong um, teaching moment for them. Now, I need to go back actually before this, that's something I think is very, very important. And that is in, uh, this, this is taking place, this, this uh, with Moses is, is in the Exodus, the book of Exodus. Previous to that is in the book of Genesis. 
and just real quickly, Abraham, our father Abraham, goes into uh, to battle to save his, his nephew Lot uh, against some tribes who have captured him and all of his goods. He goes in, he recaptures him and brings him back into town. And the town's name is Salem. And the king of Salem welcomes him back with great fanfare and says, please, we need to come. I want to bless you and I want to feed you. We need to celebrate. So they, um, Abraham and Lot come spend some time with this priest whose name is Melchizedek. And Melchizedek brings out, what does he bring out for this blessing and this celebration? Bread and wine. So that's the first time we're kind of introduced to this is, you know, you wouldn't realize it then. But now as the story starts to unfold, you see how God is using bread and wine to, um, to feed and care for and heal his people. So now he has used bread to heal his people in the wilderness. He fed them. Um, so we, we have to kind of go now to, um, to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we first see them um, at the, the wedding of Cana. And Jesus is asked by his mother, right? Um, they, they, need, they need more wine. So he ta- we know the story, right? He changes the water into wine. So Jesus elevates everything. So now he's taking wine and and elevating it into into, uh, wine. And now at the Last Supper, when he's sitting with his apostles and he's telling them that he's going to give up his life for us and that he's going to turn. And what does he do? He takes bread and he takes wine. Now we can now go all the way back to that um, first story in Abraham and we can see how, how God has been wanting to use this to feed us. The difference is, is that because Jesus elevates everything, he's now asking, he's now going to take that bread and make it into his body. He's going to take that wine and make it into his blood. That's hard for us to understand, right? That's that's the mystery. That's the mystery of God. For so for as us as as Christians, we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So if we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, can he change that bread and that wine into his body and blood? Absolutely, absolutely, can. Because he told us to do it in Scripture, right? Um, but it's not uncommon for lots of people, and and even priests, to get to the point where they're having a hard time realizing just that that's such an amazing thing. Um, so there's been stories over the years of priests who have have struggled with that. I have a story here, just real real quickly, from 750 A.D., in which a priest was really really struggling. Um, just he's being tempted to to not believe that during the consecration that the, <clears throat> that that bread was going to change into the body of Christ he was having dots thoughts in his mind doubts in his mind and what happened was a miracle and the miracle was the mystery was that that he the, the that at the elevation that bread started to bleed and became flesh so much so that he was startled he put it down and they took it back into the sacristy and then eventually took it to the bishop for them to take a look at it and say, you know, look what happened. Uh, this is the first time this miracle of, of this magnitude happened. So, um, so now we uh, fast forward to 1970, 1,200 years later, um, and, we, and some scientists begin to take that 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 um, body of Christ or that host, um, and they start to investigate it scientifically. And there's some things that they start to find out scientifically. The coagulated substance is indeed human blood, they found out. It is actually AB type blood with the same protein distribution as is found in normal flesh blood, fresh blood. The host is of human muscular striated striated tissue of the myocardium, of the left ventricle of the heart. The arteries, veins, the branch of the vagus nerve and the adipose tissue uh, all can be identified. So I'm sure I'm not saying a lot of those words. If any of your parents are doctors, will probably laugh at my pronunciation. But what it's saying is, when they un- scientists could actually identify um, you know, that this was a part of a, a human heart, that it was taking the properties of a human heart. Like the blood, the flesh is also fresh, living tissue, because it responded rapidly to all the clinical reactions distinctive of a living being. So as they tested it with certain chemicals and things, it would react. It's over 1,200 years old. Um, 
So this test uh, was done by the medical, medical Commission of the WHO. That's the World Health Organization. That may sound familiar to you now because during this pandemic, we have gone to the World Health Organization, the same health organization, um, to have them help us um, figure out how to handle the pandemic. So this is a recognized world organization who did an investigation into the substance of this host. They, they, they kept, um, kept looking into it and got to the point where they could not explain it. So, they, so they're, I like to quote them where they said, science, aware of its limits, has come to a halt face to face with the impossibility of giving an explanation. There was no explanation as to why that host had all those properties of a living being. So we are talking about something that is supernatural. Um, it is something that only God can do. And we, we receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity at mass because that's what he's asked us to do in scripture. He told us that we should eat his, bread, eat his body and drink his blood so that we can be one with him because that is the last and eternal um, covenant. So that as part of his covenantal people, we're given this great gift to receive his body, blood, soul, and divinity. So it's a very, very difficult thing for us to be able to, in our minds, to be able to understand. But here you have a, a miracle. And since then, we've had many, many more miracles that have come about as a result of that, as God continues to make himself known. So, so they asked this, they answered this first question. So why does the bread and wine still uh, taste the same even after it's supposed to be Jesus? Um, it's, it, is, it still retains its body, uh, 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 its substance of bread. But Jesus, in his supernatural um, ability, in his divine nature, is able to infuse his living being into that substance. So that it still tastes like bread, but he can, and he's actually, because of his, his desire is actually his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Mm -hmm. It's it's a difficult thing to, to, to understand. It makes it, even priests are challenged with that at times. Um, the next question, who makes the bread and wine for the Eucharist? Are they uh, specially made or from a store? They are specially made. We used to have a, uh, a monastery in Missouri that would make it for us. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, they actually are not able to do it anymore. So we have changed and now we use a company, I believe it's out of Massachusetts, um, called Kavanaugh, who has the correct formula uh, to be able to, pr to provide it for us. Uh, next question is, why use bread and wine, not something like lamb chops and water? And I think that question obviously has been answered because that was God's intention from the, from the get-go. His intention to use bread um, as a great symbol uh, of, of being fed manna from heaven, bread from heaven. And he himself becomes the living bread. Right? It's very humble. It's very humble. And God came, and Christ came to us humbly, mm -hmm. you know. And it's something that everybody knows and has and can relate to throughout of all of history. Mm -hmm. It's just this beautiful. It's yeah. It's life changing. Okay, so um, when does the bread and wine become Jesus during the mass? It's, it's called the words of institution. So um, when Father and I say, um, uh, take this, this is my body. I've just forgotten the words. I say it every single day, but uh, I'm so used to it in the rhythm of Mass. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, take, this, all of you. take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. So when we finish up, that those are called the words of institution. And if we raise up the, that host, that host is now contains Jesus, his essence, his being in it, which is why we hold it up for all of us to be seated. Quite often during Mass, people will, will humbly bow their heads because we're not worthy of that. But actually what he wants us to do is, is to gaze upon him, that he has made himself known in this supernatural way uh, to feed us. So it's the same thing with the words of institution for the cup. So. Thank you, Father. That gives me goosebumps. I love the Eucharistic miracles. Me too. And me too. Thank you. And thank you guys for your questions. Um, great questions. Yes. Thank you. Have a great evening.